In previous videos, I've talked a bit about voltage, current, and resistance, three important characteristics of electrical circuits. Voltage is the pressure that enables current to flow, current is the movement of electrical energy through a conductor, and resistance is the opposition to that current flow. It turns out, all three are bound up in a constant, predictable relationship called Ohm's Law. Let's look at the relationship. When components are arranged in such a way that electrical energy can flow through them, we call the arrangement a circuit. A circuit can be etched into the surface of a tiny board or strung for hundreds of miles on metal towers. Every circuit must have a source of energy, something that's creating the push, the voltage, so current can flow, something that separates positives and negatives, like one of the six sources I covered in my video on potential difference, friction, pressure, heat, light, magnetism, or chemical reaction. The word circuit implies a path, a route for the electrical energy to follow. In practical circuits, this means a conductor, generally a wire or other low resistance material, arranged in a way to connect components so that current can flow. That wire needs to be insulated, separated from surrounding material, to prevent short circuits and inadvertent contacts. Practical circuits have a load, something that uses the flow of electrical energy. Without the resistance of the load, there would be nothing to restrain the flow of energy through the circuit. We'd have what's called a dead short. There would be a mad rush of charges through the wire, and overheating and damage could result. The flow of electrical energy is called current, and is measured in amps, milliamps, or kiloamps, depending on the scale. Most circuits have some kind of switch, used as a valve to stop and start the flow of current. In a small circuit, it's just that, a switch. In larger circuits, we call them circuit breakers. Switches are typically drawn in the open position, but in reality, no current flows unless the switch is closed. One more critical piece. Our circuit needs protection, so we insert a fuse, a simple device that stops excessive flow to prevent damage. In a simple circuit, the fuse is a piece of thin wire, sized so that excess flow of current will cause it to heat up and melt, breaking the circuit and preventing damage to other components. Larger circuits are protected by more sophisticated devices, but all are designed to monitor current flow and open the circuit before damage is done. So, here are the components, arranged in a simple circuit. When the switch is closed, current flows through the conductor and load from the source and back to it. The insulation, which would cover all the wire, prevents short circuits, and the fuse protects from excessive current flow. The work that our simple circuit does, lighting the bulb, has two components, volts and amps. We must have both the pressure to push the energy, as well as the flow of energy for our circuit to work. The measure of work in a circuit is, therefore, a combination of both, and in its simplest form is just volts times amps, which, when totaled, is called power and is measured in watts. A circuit with 10 volts of pressure and 1 amp of current is consuming 10 watts of power. A different circuit with 1 volt of pressure and 10 amps of current is also consuming 10 watts of power. Both circuits accomplish the same amount of work. Ponder the importance of varying volts and amps by answering this question. Of the two circuits we just talked about, which has the hotter wire? The answer? The greater the current, the more the wire is heated, so the 10 amp circuit, B, is much hotter than the 1 amp circuit. If we wanted to transmit power a long way, low current is good, because that means less energy is lost to heat. This is a critical factor in future discussions of electrical transmission. The idea that multiplying volts times amps gives you the power consumption of the circuit is a useful tool, because with an equation like that, it's possible to determine any one value if you know the other two. 
Here's an example. If a 60 watt light bulb is wired into a 120 volt circuit, we can determine the current flow through the bulb. What would you have to multiply 120 by to get 60? Of course, one half. So a 60 watt light bulb in a 120 volt circuit draws one half amp of current. So we know now that multiplying volts times amps gives watts or the power being consumed by the circuit. What do you think would happen to the flow in a circuit if we increased the resistance? The squiggly line added here is the symbol for a resistor, any device that adds resistance to a circuit and makes it harder for current to flow. So what happens? Well, sure, increasing the amount of resistance decreases the current flow. That makes sense. What about decreasing the resistance? Well, of course, current flow increases. Here's one for you. What would happen to current if the voltage or push was increased? Yep, more voltage, more current. And guess what? Less voltage, less current. It turns out that there's a constant, predictable relationship between voltage, current, and resistance in a circuit. Current in a circuit is directly proportional to voltage and inversely proportional to resistance. Quite a few years back, a guy in Switzerland played around with simple circuits a lot and figured that rule out. If you double the push, you double the current. If you double the resistance, you cut the current in half. It works all the time in every circuit. So we named the law and the unit of resistance after him, George Simon Ohm. Just like volts are named after Alessandro Volta, amps after Andre Amper, and watts after James Watt, Ohm said, current varies directly with voltage and inversely with resistance. So we can take Ohm's statement about the relationship and turn it into a formula. Voltage equals current times resistance, or using the common symbols for these values, E equals I times R. Since this stable relationship exists, it's possible to determine any one value in a circuit if you know the other two. The diagram here shows you how that is possible. This circle shows the relationship. Cover the value you want to know, and the calculation you need to do it is revealed. This is an algebraic manipulation of the formula E equals I times R, but don't let that scare you. Remember this circle and you can solve Ohm's law problems. Need to know current? Cover the I. The horizontal line tells us to divide the voltage by the resistance. If we knew our circuit had a 12 volt source and a four ohm resistor, Ohm's law tells us that three amps of current will flow. Need to know resistance? Cover the R. You must divide the voltage by the current. If we knew our circuit had a 12 volt source and 3 amps of current, Ohm's law tells us that the circuit has 4 ohms of resistance. How about voltage? Cover the E. The vertical line tells us to multiply current times the resistance. If we knew our circuit had 3 amps of current and 4 ohms of resistance, Ohm's law tells us that there is a 12 volt source. You'll notice that the circuit shown here looks a little different from the ones we have been using so far. This is the way circuits are represented in drawings. The first symbol is the voltage source. The A stands for amperes, so 2A represents the current. 5 ohms is the measure of resistance. Try this problem. Remember, Cover the value you want to find. The answer is 2.5 ohms, right? 10 volts divided by 4 amps gives us 2.5 ohms. Ohm's law says that these relationships have to exist. If you have a 10 volt source and 4 amps of current are flowing, the resistance of the circuit must be 2.5 ohms. What about this one? Well, sure, 2 volts divided by 4 amps equals 1 half ohm. Easy, right? 
So that's Ohm's law. Current in a circuit is directly proportional to voltage and inversely proportional to resistance every time. Thanks for watching.